All right, we've been uh, in a series here that we just started last week. It's called uh, Songs for Life. And uh, we're taking some of the songs out of the songbook that's in the Bible called the Psalms. And uh, last week we had a message that uh, most of you will remember it as, Don't Worry, Be Happy. <laughs> and we did sing, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Uh, but uh, it was how to live worry-free. But today I want to look at how to live with meaning, with meaning. Um, there's a book in the Bible called Ecclesiastes. And uh, the book of Ecclesiastes begins by saying, meaningless, meaningless, says the preacher. Everything is meaningless, utterly meaningless. And we're meaningless, it's, it's nothing. But the next verse gives us the clue to what he's talking about. He says, it's just sheer vanity and vain, all the labors of man under the sun. For 11 chapters, he pounds away the same thing. And you think after his first chapter, you get it to the second chapter, you say, okay, I got it. 11 chapters worth, he says that nothing in this life without God has any meaning. It's all meaningless. Meaningless, meaningless says the preacher. In the third chapter, verse 11, it was one of my favorite verses in the whole book. It says this, God has set eternity in the heart of man. That's a pretty big hole in the heart of man. It's a black hole. It's infinite. It's eternity. And here's what happens. This is what Solomon discovered. He said, I, I, I went on an experiment and I tried to fill that black hole with things. He said, I tried to fill it with education and knowledge. And he said, I was always empty. He tried to fill it with relationships. Come on, the guy had 700 wives. <laughs> 300 concubines. That's a thousand women in his life. You, you know, the guy had to buy like three birthday cards every day. <laughs> Come on. Like, are you kidding me? He said, with all of that, trying to fill it with relationships, empty, meaningless. So he went on building projects. He tried to build a huge empire. He says at the end, it's all empty. No matter what he puts in there, jobs, friends, relationships, uh, pleasures, he tried everything that there was as pleasures. And he said, I'm empty, it's empty, it's empty. And then when you get to the end of the book, he says this. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. You want to have a meaningful life. You remember your creator in the days of your youth. You remember God. You live for God. He says, here's the sum of the whole matter. Obey God and keep his commandments. That's it. If you want a meaningful life. Well, that's what I want to talk about today. A meaningful life. And, and the first thing I want to notice here. All right, so how do we live with meaning? And uh, we, I want to suggest that we don't live with meaning by our culture. Not like our culture lives. Our culture lives by trying to throw everything inside that big black hole, that emptiness that's inside. And they try to fill it up with, with meaningless stuff. And, and then they think they're going to be satisfied with doing all of that. But, but that's never going to happen. In fact, we need to actually, we'll, we'll see that what they actually do, because that doesn't fill it all up, they kind of get nasty. <laughs> Is that, and they begin to plot against the Christian who has a meaningful life because they have something that's filling up that emptiness. And, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it says that Jesus is God come in the flesh. And as God come in the flesh, he is eternal and he's infinite. In the book of Ephesians, it says that he dwells in our hearts by faith. So when I was an eight-year-old boy and I accepted Jesus as my Savior, he invaded my body, he filled my heart, so that empty black hole is now filled with the infinite God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And, and so what happens? Because I have a good, meaningful life. Those who look at my life, and, and, and I'm actually operating counter to their culture, they've got to tear me down. And so he says here, the wicked plot against the righteous, and they gnash their teeth at them. Jesus said, if they hate me, they will also hate you. And for no other reason than you know Christ. It says they also, it says that the wicked, they plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth against them, but the Lord laughs at them. Now, now this isn't because he thinks anything they said is funny. It's, it, it's not a laugh because he thinks, oh, that's a good one, ha, ha, ha. But it's the laugh where it says, you've got to be kidding you think that you can thwart me, the eternal God? Do you really think that you're going to vanquish my people? Oh, from time to time, you win a battle, but anybody here ever read the end of the book? I, know, I got a lot of you reading the, the, the Bible. We're going through the Bible this year. None of you got to the end yet, but in the end, we win. Amen. Jesus wins. And, and so what are, you, what are you saying? He said, you've got to be kidding you're attacking my people. He goes on and says, they want to slay us. The wicked draw their, their, their swords and they bend their bows and they're wanting to bring down, they want to bring us down. The poor and the needy, they trample all over us. They want to slay those who are upright in their ways, who are doing things right. Listen, if they hated Jesus, they'll hate me too. That's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. But their swords will ultimately pierce their own hearts and their bows will be broken. Now, I want to tell you a little story. It's found in 1 Samuel. You know this story, right? It's the story of David and Goliath. David's about 17 year old. He's just a teenager. Goliath is a man of war, nine feet tall. He's a giant. He's the end of the line of giants. There's him and his four brothers. They're giants. And uh, they come out to battle against Israel. And he raises his arm and he defies the Israelites to send out a man, their tallest guy, fight me. Well, it just so happens that the tallest guy in the Israel army is King Saul. He stood head and shoulders above all his men, but he's not quite as big as Goliath. And Saul doesn't want to go out and fight him. None of the men do. But David arrives on the scene because he's bringing some uh, supplies to his brothers who had enlisted in the army. And when he gets to the battle scene, he sees what's going on. He says, what's going to be given to the man, who, or in his case, the boy, that's going to go out and fight this giant? And they said, but you're a boy. What are you doing? What are you talking like that? Well, to make the longer story short, he tries on King Saul's armor because he's volunteered to go out and fight the giant, and, and it's too cumbersome. He can't walk around or do anything in it. And so what does this guy do? He goes out and he collects five small stones, puts them in his pouch, goes out, puts them in his sling as he says, hey, Goliath sees him coming and says, what is this? They're sending out a boy with me. <laughs> He's got a stick. That would be uh, David's club. He's got a boy with a stick. What's he think I am? A dog? That I'm, He's come out to fetch me? And, and what's, he says, no, but I, I come in the name of the Lord. He puts one stone in it and he slings it and it hits him right between the eyes. And this guy comes falling over forward. Boom. One blow. I watched the History Channel and the Science Channels on TV. And on one of the History Channel programs, they took the best slinger of today and they set up a mock guy that was Goliath and the guy went out slinging and he slung and it took him several times but he finally did hit it and when it hit it, it hit it hard enough to, to crush the skull and to topple the person. Well, it wasn't a person in that case. It was just a test. Topple it down forward as if he were dead. David scientifically pulled this off. But the text says, he didn't have anything to finish him off. But our passage here says, and it's a Psalm of David, but their swords will pierce their own heart. So David had, if you read the text in Samuel, he had to take the giant's big sword. Now, just the spearhead, the iron spearhead on his spear, Goliath's spear, weighed 15 pounds. He pulls out this giant sword. He has to finish him off, and he does, fulfilling exactly what he says here in Psalm 37. The wicked, they will destroy 
themselves. They will destroy themselves. All right. And so how much, much, we, how, how much must, um, must we live to find meaning? David is not living according to his culture. Everything in the culture said, go big, go big, go big. And, and, and David said, no, but I'm small. And even though I'm small, I can take on big. How do we find? Well, we got to go counterculture. We go against the grain. While all the world is going after worldliness and carnality, we go after holiness and piety and worship. We're going against the grain every, in every way in our culture. And if we're going to find meaning, we're going to go counterculture and we're going to live content with God's little. I love this passage. Better the little that the righteous hath than the wealth of many wicked. Better is a little stone, <laughs> a little stone in the pouch of a shepherd boy than the 120 po- 20 pounds of protection that Goliath was wearing. One little stone. You see, better is a little that the righteous hath than the wealth of many wicked. Uh, you, you remember the story where uh, Jesus was uh, preaching and he turned to the disciples and he said to the disciples, hey, he said, uh, feed them. And they said, what do you mean feed them? Uh, your salary wouldn't provide enough food for all these people. And he said, well, well, well yeah, feed them. And, and finally Andrew comes over and Andrew says, well, wait, I found a kid. He's got two fish fillets. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. He said, got five Five loaves and two small fishes. I don't know why there were five. If you slice those loaves in half, you see, then you can make a sandwich out of it. But anyway, he says, you got that. And then here, this, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, everybody sit down. He prays. He, somehow he divides those and puts them into ba- baskets. And then a, the guys go out and, and they took peace out and peace out. And I know what most of you are thinking. He gave a nibble to everybody. The text at the end says the 5,000 plus all the rest who were there because it says that was just the men that they counted. All the people after they were full, after they were full, all right, they collected up 12 baskets of fragments left over. Of course, this was a great miracle. You see, what I'm trying to say is better is the little that a righteous person has than a lot. You don't have to have a lot. You don't have to be big. You don't have to be great to serve God. Think of this. One little baby boy changed the whole world. When God decided he was going to really alter all of humanity, he sends his only begotten son in the most vulnerable way as a baby. You remember what Herod tried to do? Herod is the powerful king. He can do whatever he wants. And he tries to destroy all the boys in Bethlehem. But the angel had warned him and they moved Jesus down to Egypt because the Bible says his son would be called out of Egypt. Listen, all of this is going on because little, little is much when God is in it. That's what it is. You know, when I think about the church itself, Jesus picks not the high and the mighty. He picks fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, people that would normally not be chosen. In fact, the Bible says God has chosen the base things of this world. If you think you're something and you're a Christian, God says you're pretty base. Don't think too highly of yourself. He takes these small 12, band of 12 chickens. They're all hiding from, from after the resurrection. They're all hiding. And he has to send a spirit. And when the spirit empowers them, this little, tiny, small band changes the whole world. That's why we're here today. Jesus commissioned him to go and preach the gospel to everyone, and that has gone on and on and on. You see, what I'm trying to say is, you need to learn to be content with whatever your circumstances are, whether you've got giants in your life, what's going on. You need to learn to be content. He says, because godliness with contentment is great gain. Great gain. I put it this way, little is much when God is in it. Secondly, you have to live backed up by, by God's power. For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. Jesus 
did the most powerful thing that could be done. He raised himself from the dead. He said, if you take my life, I have the ability and power to take it up again. And he did. We live a life backed up by the power of God. We live reassured also of God's knowledge. The days of the Lord, or the days of the blameless are known by the Lord. The Lord knows what is in your life. The fact that he knows it means it will be certain because you can't know that which is uncertain. So what's happening in your life was known by God because God has rendered it certain that it would happen and be in your life. He knows what's going on. You need to be reassured that, hey, this isn't outside of what God knows and God's control. God's absolutely in control of everything. And he said he's going to work everything together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The next thing it says in the passage is you live anticipating God's plenty. In the times of disaster, they will not wither. In the days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. Even if the stock market were to crash, and those of you who are dependent upon your, uh, all your investments and you're retired, even if it were to crash and come crashing down like in, in the, the stock market crash in 1929, he says uh, that God will provide plenty enough for you. Not more than you need, just plenty enough to get you by. The Lord's enemies will... Uh, it says here, but the wicked will perish. The Lord's enemies will be like the beauty of the fields. They will vanish and vanish like smoke. They'll be gone. They'll be gone. He says, you put your trust not in the stock market. You put your trust in God. You, you put your trust in the right place. And you then anticipate God's plenty even when everybody else is not getting it. <laughs> they live sharing God's bounty. You see, I go counterculture. I share God's bounty. The wicked borrow and do not repay again. I remember this verse from being a teenager. I asked to borrow a book from our pastor, Ralph Crotty, at the Brian Baptist Church. And he lent me the book, but inside there was a little sticker that had this verse, the wicked borrow and do not repay again. <laughs> I did take that book back. <laughs> yeah. But I like the next part. But the righteous give generously. They give generously. The world thinks I'm absolutely crazy. I give a tithe to the church? 10%? You gotta be kidding me. I mean, after all the taxes, what are you living on? Well, you know what I'm living on? God's promise, God's bounty. That if I give him 10%, he will bless the other 90% so that it's like the windows of heaven open up and he pours out a blessing. You know, the windows of heaven is a reference back to the flood. When the flood came down, I mean, when it rained then, it flooded the whole earth. He's saying, I will pour out so many blessings, you can't contain them. The world says, you're crazy. And I said, no, I love God. We're having a special missionary offering emphasis this month called the One Great Hour of Sharing. And there's envelopes in your, in your bulletins or in the pews. And, and I want to share just a little bit what this is about. Besides giving to the church, it's our responsibility to give to those who are in need. And the passage actually says, this passage actually says that the wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. They give generously. There's flooding going on in Missouri right now from uh, all the rain. There's going to be devastation and loss. Our previous offerings we've given to the one great hour of sharing are now available to them. So we don't have to take it up now. The money's already there to help them. Isn't that awesome? So what we're giving this month to the one great hour of sharing is going to be there 
for the next disaster and calamity so that when people are in need, we're a generous people. We give to those who are in need in crisis. It's already there. You see how that works? This is awesome. So I'd like to invite you to take one of those envelopes and put whatever God puts on your heart above and beyond what you give to the church to give to those who are in need. Why? Because the righteous give generously. We live counterculturally. We're not like the rest of the world. And when I do that, it gives me a profound sense of meaning and purpose and joy. It makes my life so different. The next one is that they live expecting God's blessing. When I give, I do expect God to pour out the, the, open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings so great I can't contain them. It says, those the Lord blesses will inherit the land. We talked about this last time. It was the promised land. To be outside the land was to be outside God's will. To be inside the land was to be in God's will. And he's saying here, listen, you expect a blessing because you're living in God's will that God will bless you but notice what it says but those he curses will be cut off from the land the wicked are going to be cursed they're going counterculture they're cut off they they, they don't get it they don't get the blessing the next one we have here in this text is that they follow God's path if a man if the Lord delights in a man's ways I got the path there the word way is a road the path He makes his steps firm. I like to do a new American Standard version of this because it says this. The steps of a man are established by the Lord. The Lord has established your steps. And he delights in his ways. When you are on God's path, he delights in your ways. The key is that I am to follow God's path, not the world's path. So I'm living counterculture. I'm following this different path. As we move on to the next one, it says you live holding God's hand. Though he should stumble. I'm going down the path, and it seems like this path is a tough path. It's, uh, there's a few planks out ahead. You see that? I, I can remember when I took my family camping when I had little kids at home. And, and my son David, my, my son David was with me, and we're crossing a, a bridge that had some boards out. But I knew that I could stride over that. But his little tiny legs weren't going to make it. (laughs) And and so he was actually holding my hand. And when we got to the point where that was, I just normally walked right across it with a big giant step. And of course, his little feet, they didn't. They didn't. And he's just hanging, and, but I grabbed him really firm with my hand. I didn't let him just hold my finger. I, I grabbed his hand real tight. And, and he was held even though everything was washed out underneath him. He did not fall. And the Bible is saying here, listen, when I'm counterculture and I'm in my faith, I'm trusting God, and everything seems like the bottom has fallen out, he upholds me with his hand. He carries me over to the other side. He gets me to my destination because I live holding on to God's hand. The next one is I live accepting God's security. Oh, I love this verse too. I was young. That's true, I was too. (laughs) David said, I was young, and I am now old. And yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. That's a powerful statement. Some of us are dependent upon social security. I'm telling you, if social security were to bottom out, And that's all I had coming. God would fulfill his promise of security that I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. God is my security. God will take care of me. God will take care of you. I live accepting his security. That's counterculture. The counterculture, I got to hoard everything to myself because you never know. I may not have enough gold. I mean, what if the economy collapses? I got to have gold and silver. That's what they tell me in all the advertisements on television. I, I don't have to put my trust in all that. God is going to take care of me. Tenth, I give away God's blessing. God's blessing me. You know why you have a job? In Ephesians it says... Let him who steals, steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands so that he may be able to give to those who are in need. You know why you have a job? 
so you can give to the person who is in need. Not just hoard it all up for yourself. You say, but what if I give it away then I, and I don't have? Well, guess what? You'll be one of the needy that God will put it on their heart that they'll be given to you. It's just the way it works. He says, they, all, they are always generous and they lend freely and their children will be blessed. Here's my conclusion. Living with meaning means living in God's will. Counterculture, not the world's view, God's view, his will, his way. Living with meaning means living in God's will. So how do you do that? The 27th verse is crucial. You turn from evil and do good. So I'm turning from evil and I'm turning to good. I stop doing evil, I start doing good. I don't know if the story is true, but I, I heard it. There was a Catholic priest and a Baptist preacher that kind of joined up forces. They were outside their churches, which were across the street from each other, and they had placards. And on the placard it said, Repent, the end is near. And as cars would go by, they'd honk, and teenagers would love would roll down their windows and stick their tongues out at them, say, you're crazy, and they'd do all kinds of gestures, and they were carrying their signs. And as soon as that, they went by, they went out of town, they'd hear a big screeching of tires, screams, and then utter silence. They'd carry in their signs, repent, the end is near. Another car would come along, and a similar thing would happen. They'd hear all, as they just went out of town, Screeching of tires, screams, utter silence. Finally, the Baptist preacher said to the Catholic priest, said, hey, you think maybe we should change the sign? So it says, turn around instead of repent. Bridge out ahead. <laughs> See, it sounds so, so humorous, but that's, that's true. The bridge is out ahead for the people who don't know Jesus. We who know Jesus, we have turned around. And we've already are going another direction. And we're holding our signs. The thing is, we gotta hold it effectively so that people know what we're saying. Listen, you're experiencing a meaningless life. Meaningless, meaningless, says the preacher. All is utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Everything you're doing. One of the things Solomon really regrets, he says, I built this huge empire, and for what? So I can give it to some fool that comes after me to destroy it all? He says, it's all meaningless. You must remember your creator in the days of your youth. You must turn from evil, turn to good. In, in 1 Thessalonians, it says they turn from their idols, the pathway of idols, and they turn to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That is what we call repentance. It's repentance and faith. I turn from something, that's repentance. I turn to something, that is faith. It's repentance and faith. If you want a meaningful life, you must have Jesus Christ. He says, then you will dwell in the land. And the land is synonymous with the will of God. You will dwell in the will of God. And notice the last word, forever. Forever. It goes beyond this life. God's will is for all eternity. It goes beyond this life. You will dwell in the land of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, there are those here today who are seeking to find meaning, purpose, to have a meaningful life, but they're not even sure what they're shooting at. Some think it's just more stuff. Others think if I just had a better relation with so-and-so. Others think if I just had a better career or more education, the Lord, everything that they do can't fill that empty hole inside. Only you can fill it. Only you can motivate us to live countercultural. Lord, you said you've come to give us life and life to the full. An abundant life that the world has no knowledge of. I pray that today that the one who's looking for meaning and purpose, wanting to have a meaningful life, that right now they'll say, 
Lord, I need you. I need you to fill my emptiness, that hole of eternity set in my heart. Lord Jesus, be my Savior. Invade my body. Reside within me. For you said you dwell in the heart by faith. I believe in you today. Save me, O Lord, I pray. I'm confident, Lord, that anyone who'd pray that with sincerity in their heart, they would call upon you. They would be saved, just as your word says. In a moment, Lord, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, which reminds us of the day we accepted Jesus and everything changed in our lives. Bless us at this table, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Just a reminder before you leave that I have two tickets for the DSO in my pocket. And uh, we also need uh, some assistance with some lunch items for after the funeral uh, that would include cookies and salads. And if you'd see Tina, if you can help with that for this Friday's uh, funeral luncheon. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.